Welcome to Some Joyful Noises, a music podcast with no rhyme, rhythm, or reason. This show is a proud member of the Anazal Podcast Network. The reason we do this show is for community, not because any of us are music experts, but rather because we believe that music helps shape community. And that's something that's really important to all of us at the Anazal Podcast Network. I'm Joshua Knoll. I am the producer of this show. I say producer and not host because this show has no host. It has no schedule. It has no format. You are just as much the host as I am. If you would like to find out how you could lead your own episode of Some Joyful Noises, then listen to the end of the show for an invitation to lead your own conversation on this podcast. We hope you enjoy this show with no rhyme, no rhythm, and no reason. This is the launch week for our podcast, Some Joyful Noises. The two most important things for a successful podcast is one, reliability and consistency. And then number two is the best first foot forward that you can put. Since this show has no plan and no schedule, we're going to drop the ball on consistency. That means it's extra important that we have a good first foot forward, and we're asking for your help. There's a few things you can do that'll take less than five minutes and cost you absolutely nothing that can help our show put our first foot forward. So here's five things that will take you less than five minutes to do for no cost that would help us. Number one, share the show. Find a friend, share the show with someone. Number two, rate and review our show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Number three, go to podchaser.com and rate and review the show there. Number four, Join our Facebook group, Some Joyful Noises. And then, of course, number five is just enjoy the show. Be sure to subscribe. And if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can go to the menu of our podcast to select automatic download. That'll help increase our downloads and tell the algorithms that this show is really important. All of these are also going to be down below in the description in case you forget any. Thank you all again so much, and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome, everyone, to Some Joyful Noises, the new podcast we're releasing as part of Anazal Ministries Podcasting Network. This is going to be a hodgepodge podcast where I, Christian Ashley, and a whole lot of other hosts across the Anazal Ministries Podcasting Network and the occasional guest will release episodes as we feel led about music, its impact on our lives, and whatever else happens to be in our mind at the time. Uh, just as a frame of reference, this is not a strictly Christian music-based show, um, but for me at least, that will be my main focus, although I do plan eventually to showcase some secular music later on. But yeah, that's what we're going for. If this is your first time hearing my voice, well, welcome. It's great to have you here. I'm a co-host of the Systematic Ecology podcast, where we discuss how the different geeky fandoms we love interact with our faith without forcing Jesus into the picture. I'm also the host of the Let Nothing Move You podcast, where I go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through scripture, having started in Luke and Romans, and I recently have finished Genesis and Exodus, and now am on my way to Leviticus. I'm also the host of the Why I Don't Like podcast, where I discuss the different media that I've consumed in the past, and yet I don't like by bringing up why I don't like them and how they can improve upon themselves. And last but not least, I also co-host Friday Night Frights with Joe Day of the Buddy Walk With Me podcast, wherein we discuss a single topic a month based on cryptozoology to paranormal, ufology, and more. As you can see, I'm a very, very busy man. I'm also a full-time seminary student, and I mean full-time. Ooh, this semester's been, it's been a challenge. But enough of that. It's time to just geek out on a very fun thing, and that, of course, being Jesus Freak by DC Talk, my favorite song of all time. You can call me cliche as much as you want. This is my jam. This is everything I love about good Christian music. So why do I care? What well, starts when I was a young lad? I grew up listening to DC Talk while going to elementary school early in the mornings with my dad. You know, back in the day, he was a high school gym teacher, and he also drove buses every now and then to make some extra cash for our family of six. Imagine that, a teacher salary not paying for his family. Can, can you imagine a world where that happens? Well, you can in North Carolina where teachers don't get paid anything. Now, back then, he owned the cassette tape that, yes, you had to change the sides and everything, if you, for us to be old enough to remember that. Uh, And this cassette tape had an impossible to determine impact on my life. 
and they called it Jesus Freak by DC Talk. And we would cycle through the songs and we'd get hyped up on his way to work while I would accompany him, you know, eventually a couple of years later with my sister in tow when she came to elementary school as well. And then once he'd gone on his bus route, he'd drop us off at school, which was right beside the high school that he taught at. And almost every single morning, we would listen to the Jesus Freak cassette and sing along with it, which he was far better than I. I will be using spoken verse as much, much as possible. I am not a singer. My voice is horrendous. Don't even pull that. Oh, Christian, it's actually kind of nice. It's like, no, I know what I sound like. I've heard myself. Uh, there will be no arguments here. But I still sing some joyful noises to the Lord because I'm commanded to do so because he has done great things for me. Now, because of this, when certain songs from that album are played, I get a sense of nostalgia that makes me extremely joyful. And that's another reason I wanted to focus on this. I love this song. I love that album because of what it reminds me of. The sacrifices of my dad, the great music we would listen to, the bonding time we would have as a result of that. And it's just something that's never happened again in the same way. You know, we're, I'm older now. He's older now. I'm several states away. You don't get to have that interaction like we used to. That's what happens when you get old. Now, as part of this, I grew up, like I said, and my love for DC Chalk never changed. I grabbed the intermission CD and played it constantly alongside the Jesus Freak album, which was packaged with it. In fact, while I was in college, uh, I played them so much in my car that my roommates, who I would often drive to school from my apartment, asked me if I listened to anything else. <laughs> now, obviously, I did, and they knew that, but we all knew which CDs got played more than others. And to this day, when I'm listening to my music on my phone, I got shuffle mode on. Jesus Freak still gets played the most. I've looked at the statistics. There, there's no other contender. It gets played the most. So the song itself, go through a bit of a, some stats and trivia to those unaware. This is, of course, written by Toby McKeon, better known as Toby Mac, and Mark Heimerman. This is sung by Kevin Max, Toby Mac, and Michael Tate, all three members of DC Talk. D, uh, excuse me, Jesus Freak had the distinct honor of being played on both Christian and alternative rock stations. Um, and the only other songs I can think of that are Christian that I know for a fact have been played in other stations other than just Christian music radio stations were like, you know, I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me and Cinderella by Stephen Curtis Chapman. I'm sure there's more. Those are just the ones that come to my head that I remember hearing on other stations and being completely surprised by them. Now, the song, uh, alongside the band themselves, earned three Dove Awards the, the year it came out for Artist of the Year. Song of the Year, and Rock Recorded Song of the Year. Now, the name itself, Jesus Freak, Where is what is the etymology of that word? Well, it's quite more complicated than you would expect. When it first came into being in the 60s and 70s, the term Jesus Freak was not a negative appellation to give to someone, but rather was meant to show that the person being referred to as, you know, a, as such was very involved and connected to Jesus. Now, your mileage is going to vary immensely, I would argue, on whether or not some of these people being referred to as Jesus freaks were actually his disciples. I'm going to say most of them weren't, given their other leanings, given their other thought processes about who Jesus was. But there were many people in that group who were also faithful followers and were called freak because that meant you were serious about something. Now, originally... This referred to some countercultural movements that liked the idea of Jesus and his teachings, but most of them weren't really his followers. And I would argue simply enjoyed him without truly experiencing him by becoming his disciples. There was a whole thing, you know, you know Jesus promotes peace, and that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, in the midst of the Vietnam War, you got your hippie movements and everything, and a Christian response to what they saw. Uh, reasonably so, I would think, at the beginning of Christians utilizing uh, justification of violence for the wrong reasons. And as too far in the other direction, I would argue, they landed places like here, where they accepted the peaceful part of Jesus while forgetting there was also a wrathful side of Jesus. And so as time went on, the term then devolved, especially around the 80s and 90s, which, which really came about into referring to someone who only talks about Jesus to the detriment of themselves as they focus on nothing else. Now, 
I'm not inherently against that idea because there are far too many Christians that I know who don't speak about anything else, who don't engage in the culture in any way, shape, or form. They just go to church, and that's all they do. They read their Bibles, and they hang out with their family, and they preach about Jesus. And hey, yeah, I'm here to preach about Jesus, but I'm also here to be a part of the world, which he commanded us to do. So in light of that, when we get to DC Talk, Part of the reason they named the album as they did was to attempt to reclaim this word to then mean that a Jesus freak was someone who was totally sold out on Jesus Christ and was a faithful follower who wished for everyone they met to feel the same. This meant they engaged with the culture. They met with people. They didn't just sit in their house reading the Bible and singing hymns and just going to church every Sunday and every Wednesday, even Friday or whenever they felt like it, and they never experienced the people they were supposed to be loving. That's what a true Jesus freak is, one who seeks after him and then follows his commands. And that's what they were attempting to do with this song is talk about that. So what I'd like to do is a line-by-line -line analysis of the song, and we'll get into some more heavier topics after we do this. But just to start off, once again, I am not singing this. I love you more than that. So I would just be doing spoken verse. Separated, I cut myself clean from a past that comes back in my darkest of dreams. Let's stop there for a second. This right here, every Christian who has turned away from who they were, who has repented of who they were, has felt this at some point in time. The remembrance of who they were before Jesus Christ pains them. It shames them in their eyes because they know what they did and they know their eyes and their hearts were not set upon him and were instead set upon self to their detriment and to the detriment of those around them. That's a harsh way to start off a song, because no doubt, if you're listening to this and you're actually understanding the lyrics, you're going to go, oh, I felt that before. I've been the person this is talking about. But the good thing is the song continues. Been apprehended by a spiritual force and a grace that replaced all the me I've divorced. That's the good news. We don't have to be those old people we were, the old man, the old woman we were before coming to Jesus Christ. We've changed. We've moved on beyond that because he is changing us. We are divorcing ourselves from who we used to be and remarrying our ultimate husband, our ultimate provider and carer in Jesus Christ. Now, some people may go, oh, how dare they use the word divorced? But no, the, the word has other meanings besides the dissolving of a marriage. And this the idea is that you are wholly removing that other part of you for something else. There's, a, there's a, uh, an idea, uh, it's called kenosis, uh, the idea of removing one's own will and replacing it with someone else's. This someone else would be Jesus Christ, who we know is better than us, who we know is actually looking out for us and wanting us to experience him and everything he has to offer and doesn't have to be ashamed of the past. Yet we need to learn from that past, but we don't need to remain in that past. We don't need to stay there. We need to move on into this kingdom, a new creation. And that's what the song is talking about there. Is that spiritual force has removed this part from us because it got a hold of us. And that grace replaced the me I've divorced. Now we get to some Toby Mac rap lyrics here. I also promise not to rap. You're better off. I saw a man with a tat on his big fat belly. It wiggled around like marmalade jelly. It took me a while to catch what it said because I had to match the rhythm of his belly with my head. Jesus saves it is what it raved in a typical tattoo green. He stood on a box in the middle of the city and he claimed he had a dream. All of us at some point in time have heard the term street preacher and gone. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad thing. Now, I don't think that's always a bad thing. Paul did it. Jesus did it. Plenty of people I know. Uh, I'll just give an example of someone else. Carairo, Foreign Saints. He goes out. And he engages people on the streets. He has signs. He will speak boldly. He doesn't do it in an obnoxious manner. He doesn't do it in a moral superiority kind of way of just saying, I'm so much more spiritually better than you. But it's a way of engaging other people. But this isn't what this song is talking about. Not those type of street preachers. This is talking about the cliche. The one that every one of us is thinking of when we hear the term street preacher. The crazy person. The one who may be wielding a sign that has a verse that may be from Revelation or uh, something that's condemning other people to hell. 
and speaking out against the evils of the world and as if they're somehow much better than them, holier than thou kind of attitude, may look deranged, may even be homeless. You got that image in your head? I know we all do at some point in time, but some, a bit of that you amalgamate together. That's what the song is talking about. Yeah, this person seems like maybe, maybe they're gods. Maybe they're Jesus's. They got, I mean, it takes a lot to put Jesus saves on your body in a tattoo form. Like, yeah, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you're saved, but it's a step that a lot of people wouldn't make if they're not serious about it. But it's how he presents himself that they're distracted by the physical so they don't hear what he's attempting to say. And this is assuming that this person is actually attempting, excuse me, to save souls. More than likely, this person is doing it for the sake of being seen, the sake of being seen as better than others. Back in the day when I was in college, there was a gentleman, and I think that's the nicest uh, term I can use for this man, uh, named Brother Ross. And every now and then I would walk by. We had this little amphitheater uh, we had near the bridges and a little pond section we had. And he would sign up, as was his legal right to do, and espouse a version of Christianity that said that he himself was perfect. He had never sinned ever since becoming a believer. And he may have even argued before they'd never sinned before. I don't remember. It's been about a decade since I've last seen him. But he would just shout at people and saying, you're all filthy. You're all going to hell. You're all, all these terrible things that, hey, some of it may even have been true. But it was the presentation that screwed any positive thing he might have been able to make out of it from reaching anyone. And I don't believe this man was actually our brother in Christ. I think he was just as lost as the people he was attempting to save. I hope that he has actually realized that he is not a sinless man, that he has a lot of work he needs to get done, just like the rest of us do, and that he has come to faith. But I haven't heard of him in like 10 years. Who knows? But the point being, just like the person in this song, he was presenting himself in a manner that had nothing to do with spreading the gospel. It had everything to do with the spectacle of who was saying it. Listen to me. And that's not what, that's not how Jesus presented himself. Yes, the goal was, hey, listen to me. I have the truth, but it wasn't done in a flashy manner. It wasn't done in a way just to make people, people feel bad about themselves. Yeah, Jesus called out sin. Just listen to what he said to the Samaritan woman in John 4. He accuses her of adultery. And my accuses, he says, you've committed adultery by him talking about how many husbands she's had and that she's with a man she's not even married to. But he didn't do it in a way to shame her. He did it in a way to bring her to the knowledge that she needed a savior. And that's where people like this fail. And that, of course, brings us into our chorus. What will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find it is true? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak. There ain't no disguise in the truth. These are the Jesus freaks that DC Talk are talking about as who we should be, as sold out to the gospel, as sold out to Jesus Christ. We are the Jesus freaks who are there, not for our sake, but for the sake of the people who we're afraid of talking to, who we're afraid that they're going to call us a freak. Yeah, as culture has changed, the word freak isn't as positive as it was in the 60s and 70s when it refers to a person. It refers to an abnormality, as someone who is less than, as someone who doesn't deserve the same amount of love and respect that us so-called regular people deserve. There's a societal weight and judgment placed when the word freak is used. But here, that's being stripped away. A Jesus freak isn't going to care if they're labeled as such because they know it's true. And that's a good thing. There ain't no disguise in the truth. If we are his, it is our goal to shine his light in the world as we can. Now, there are people out there in the world who live in countries and cultures where being a disciple of Christ is a crime. So what this is not saying is that they have to speak out boldly and get gunned down by the people in charge. No, there's, there's a way to be a bold Christian in scenarios like that without being stupid about it. Jesus Christ called us to be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. I would say it's not shrewd to preach in the middle of a city where a bunch of people are, have guns and are pointing right at you. I would say it's a lot shrewder. Get to know them, to see what their spiritual state is, and then plant the seeds that may lead them to Christ. That's being a Jesus freak. 
being a Jesus freak isn't just your Billy Graham types or your head pastor types who can you know, speak boldly about the word and they can go on evangel- uh, evangelization trips and missionary trips and bring other people to the gospel. Those are great. But being a Jesus freak is far more vast than just that. But when we hide that about ourselves, we're not the only people who suffer. And that's what the song is trying to fight against is that design of, well, I'm safe, but if I speak out, my coworkers may make fun of me or I might lose a job or people will think I'm weird. Well, guess what? You are weird. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're weird. You're a freak. And that's good because you are a freak to a world that is dead and dying and needs to see his light. It is freakish. It is an abnormality. It is antithetical to this world to believe in Jesus because they don't want to, because they want to believe in self and their accomplishments and thinking they're good enough to get into heaven. But every time Jesus speaks about salvation, it's not a everyone gets in eventually. It's, I have mine who will listen. My sheep will listen. And if we want to be his sheep who listen, that means talking to coworkers who may think we're weird or losing friends along the way. Yeah, it's, it sucks to lose those friends. I've lost them because of this. Not because, once again, I was trying to like shove Jesus into every conversation and talk down to him, but because they rejected him and me as a result of being his follower because they didn't want to make choices that changed who they were. Now we get to our second verse. Kamikaze, my death is gain. I've been marked by my maker, a peculiar display. Now, kamikaze, for those who don't know, is divine wind in Japanese. It refers way back to when the Mongols invaded in the 13th century, if I remember correctly. They did it twice, and both times they did so, a typhoon wiped out a vast majority of their ships, preventing them from invading Japan fully. Later on, that term was adapted during World War II for pilots who would uh, have their ships laden with explosives and would attempt to destroy different U.S. ships uh, by just flying straight into them and sacrificing themselves in in the process. It's not a sacrifice, it's senseless. But in a reversal of that, the song is making us kamikazes because that is the Christian life. My death is gain, unlike the World War II Japanese pilots who thought that they were doing something noble, we actually are. Were we to die for his sake, we are actually martyrs if we die. You may have heard, may have wondered, what's the difference between a revolutionary and a martyr? Well, all martyrs are revolutionary and not all revolutionaries are martyrs. A martyr is someone who gives up their life for the sake of others, not for self, not for false ideology, not for fame, but for others. And the greatest other of all for us is Jesus Christ. And that's why he's marked us a peculiar display, because according to the logic of the world, that doesn't make sense. It makes no sense to be that kind of person. Why would you think dying is gain? Don't you want to live forever? Don't you want your legacy to last forever, knowing in our heart of hearts that's impossible? But the world conveniently forgets that fact because it's about me and about what I want. But when you become a disciple... It's not about you. It's about him and what he wants. We'll continue on in the verse. The high and lofty, they see me as weak because I won't live and die for the power they seek. There it is. The world's wisdom is flawed and foolish. They seek for self-gain. We seek for his gain. To deny ourselves, to be a kamikaze to the ideals of this world who are higher and loftier than us and think they're better than us is anathema to people who don't understand Jesus Christ. It looks like foolishness. It looks like we're dying for a lost cause. That's why we, when we look at Japanese history when, at the end of World War II, we go, they died for no reason. But that's how the world sees you and I, if you are his. Why would they ever die for some guy, some Jewish guy who died 2,000 years ago? Well, because that Jewish guy died, resurrected, and ascended for my sake and yours. That's why. We do what we do, not for the power they seek, but for the power he gifts us to bring others to him, to save a world that is lost. And we go from there to the pre-chorus. There was a man from the desert with naps in his head. The sand that he walked was also his bed. The words that he spoke made the people assume there wasn't too much left in the upper room. 
with skins on its back and hair on his face. They thought he was strange by the locusts he ate. You see, the Pharisees trip when they heard him speak until the king took the head of this Jesus freak. And it is here that they place the story, the life story of John the Baptist in just a couple lines, a verse. A man who was sold out for Jesus Christ, one of the original, if not the original, Jesus freak. His cousin, who knew why he was on this earth, was not to bring glory to himself, but for himself to decrease and Jesus to increase looking once more like a fool to the high and lofty. The Pharisees thought they knew better than everyone else. They had the scripture. They memorized it. And then they made extra laws on top of everything else to look even more pious than everyone else. But then there's this strange guy in the middle of the desert who's eating locusts and eating honey and covered with these you know, different animal skins, bringing people to faith and baptizing him. How dare he? take their authority away. Who is he? Someone who is actually following God, someone who is actually following Jesus Christ. And for this crime, King Herod had him murdered because he would not admit that he was in the wrong for giving a vow that he had to save face and the head of John the Baptist was to price, even though he liked John to an extent, because John called him out for the evils he did in marrying a wife he never should have taken. And because of that offense, because they were acting in a sinful manner, well, no, we can't change ourselves. We're in the right because we're in charge. John had to go. And yet at the end of the day, only one of those is going to be with Jesus Christ in the end. And it's not going to be the person who murdered him and never repented. We go back into the chorus again. I won't repeat it. Then we go to the bridge. People say I'm strange. Does it make me a stranger that my best friend was born in a manger? And that line is repeated, doesn't it? Our best friend, if you if you are Jesus Christ's child, if you've repented of your sins and turned to him, your best friend was born in a manger, in a lowly, forgotten place that we would never remember if the Gospels hadn't recorded it for us, if God had not inspired them to do so. A king doesn't deserve to be buried, it's buried there, <laughs> to be born there. A king deserves to be born in a palace where everyone knows he's next in line. He's going to be the one to solve all of our problems. But the king of the universe was born in the form of helpless babe in a manger. And that very same baby grew up to be the best friend you and I need to save us from ourselves. So once again, according to the world's logic, that makes no sense. But he makes it make sense. He does the inane. He does the illogical process to shame the world, to make them realize they're being made fun of for resisting him, for not following after him. Then we get some repeats of the chorus. And in the outro, we get, what will people think? What will people think? What will people do? What will people do? I don't really care. What else can I say? There ain't no disguising the truth. And the final line of the song, Jesus is the way. It's absolutely beautiful. It ends with the central premise. If you want to be a Jesus freak, there's only one way to do that following him, saying he is the only way. Now, what I'd like to do here, as the song is finished, is a little segment I'd like to call, Let's Exegete the Sucker. (laughs) And we're going to do that, I think, in three parts here. One point I'm going to bring up that the song also brings up is speaking in the midst of persecution. I would like to point you all to Matthew 10, 32 through 33. This is in the NLT. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. This relates to the line, what will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find it's true? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak. There ain't no disguising the truth. When we are his, there is no hiding who we are. There is no denying who we are. There's being smart about it. You don't have to bring up Jesus Christ in every single conversation you have. If you're in a situation where it's probably going to cause you death, I would argue more than likely, shut up and wait for an opportunity to speak truth. But for here, we see what happens to those who say they're his or deny that they're his, because if they're denying they're his, they were never saved to begin with. They were never his at all. And he's going to deny them in the same way before the Father when it's their time. Jesus talks earlier in Matthew of people who say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Do we not cast out demons in your name? Do we not do all these things in your name? 
And he's going to say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. People are going to think they're on the same side as you and I, and the whole time they've never once experienced Jesus. But to those who are his, to you and I who are, what this is telling us to do is to be bold and speak up. When you hear someone saying, all churches are the same, all churches just, all they do is just uh, manufacture hatred uh, against women and the LGBT community and all these terrible things. It's like, hate, hate, hate. That's all the church does. They say, well, what's your proof of that? Is it hatred? If you know right from wrong to tell that person in a loving manner, don't do it. Save yourself from that. Come to God. That's love, not hatred. But the world sees it as hatred because you're telling me how to live my life. I'm not telling you. Jesus is. So that's going to cost friendships. That's going to cost us things in this world, promotions, whatnot. But it's all going to be worth it in the end. Because when the time comes for our account to be given, he's going to remember who denied him. He's going to remember who didn't. Now, that's not to say if you ever deny him, this is a flat blanket statement that you're automatically your salvation is gone. It's not how salvation works. That means you had a moment of weakness. You gave into sin. It's time to repent. The people that Jesus is talking about there are the ones who persist in their lawlessness, in their denial of him, thinking that they are his. That won't be you if you've repented, if you've sought after him. The next step, we have John the Baptist. Also in Matthew, this would be in chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, this time in the NIV. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That is a man who is a Jesus freak. That is a man who has denied himself. He has a following. He has people seeking wisdom from him. John the Baptist could have taken them and made his own church, but he didn't because he was set out for Jesus Christ as that Jesus freak. He called out evil. He called out good. He brought people to repentance, knowing he couldn't save them, but it prepared the way for the one who could. That is why they use him in this song. Okay, someone who actually believes in what he's saying, who is actually an effective street preacher, or passes as a street preacher in the middle of the desert while you're munching on locusts and wearing camel hair for your clothing. Looking like an absolute madman, looking like a fool to the world that doesn't understand you, looking like a fool to the establishment who thought that, oh, well, this new thing's propping up. Therefore, I'll, I'll put my weight around here just to, you know, give it a little, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Give it a little legitimacy. And John calls it out because that evil has no place in the church. And for that, he was murdered. But he is the victor because he was sold out for Jesus Christ as that Jesus freak. Now, the last part here. Jesus is the way is how the song ends. Where does that come from? Let's flip over to John 14, 1 through 6, at this time in the ESV. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Doubting Thomas, that guy that everyone ostracizes, is asking a legitimate question, and his faith is rewarded because Jesus gives him an answer. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is an absolute. You can argue about it all day long. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. 
and believing his sacrifice and believing in who he is. And the song portrays that perfectly by ending with that Jesus is the way. You want to know how to be a Jesus freak? Follow him. Listen to Jesus. Be him. Be more like him. Divorce yourself from who you were. Be replaced with that kenosis of Jesus Christ, that new will, and you're his. And your salvation is assured. No matter how many times we screw up along the way, no matter how many times we fail to speak up for Jesus like we know we should, a true Jesus freak on this earth is a failure at times, but most of the time, they're solid. They're his. Yeah, you're going to screw up. Yeah, I'm going to screw up. But there's forgiveness for a reason, because God knows who we are and he's working on making us better Jesus freaks. So with that, we're done for today. Thank you all for listening. Please, if you get a chance, just leave a five star review on your podcasting platform of choice. If you're interested in me and my own fiction writing, you can find my works at starvingwritersguild.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the NSL Ministries Podcasting Network. You can find me specifically once more on Let Nothing Move You, Systematic Ecology, Why I Don't Like, and Friday Night Frights. But remember to always send up some joyful noises to the Lord, no matter how bad your singing voice may be. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Some Joyful Noises, a proud member of the Anazal Podcast Network. You can listen to other Anazal podcasts with the link that's down below in this show's description. If you have ideas for this show or would like to lead one of these episodes, then you can email us at Podcast at gmail.com and pitch an idea to us and we'll talk about it and see whether or not we can make it work for you to lead your own episode. We hope to hear from you soon and that you'll help us keep it noisy. This is the launch week for our podcast, Some Joyful Noises. The two most important things for a successful podcast is one, reliability and consistency. And then number two is the best first foot forward that you can put. Since this show has no plan and no schedule, we're going to drop the ball on consistency. That means it's extra important that we have a good first foot forward, and we're asking for your help. There's a few things you can do that'll take less than five minutes and cost you absolutely nothing that can help our show put our first foot forward. So here's five things that will take you less than five minutes to do for no cost that would help us. Number one, share the show. Find a friend, share the show with someone. Number two, rate and review our show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Number three, go to podchaser.com and rate and review the show there. Number four, join our Facebook group, Some Joyful Noises. And then, of course, number five is just enjoy the show. Be sure to subscribe. And if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can go to the menu of our podcast to select automatic download. That'll help increase our downloads and tell the algorithms that this show is really important. All of these are also going to be down below in the description in case you forget any. Thank you all again so much, and we hope you enjoy the show.